if you're in the house, come on up. I want to see your costumes. I want to see your faces. I want to look into your eyes this morning and have a brief chat about superheroes and Jesus and trick-or-treating. So come on up. Come on up. Just come on up to the stage. Uh, we'll just kind of we'll hang out up here today. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. We'll just, yeah, make a little circle. How are you guys doing this morning? That good. All right. Yeah, first service. Give it up. Man, you guys look great. Sage, oh, you look beautiful, my princess. That is amazing. So have you guys gotten to go trick-or-treating yet? You have. Did you totally cash out on the candy? A little bit? Are you sharing that candy? It's gone? That is my girl. Yeah, give it up. That's right. I, uh, I had a bucket of candy. Um, I no longer have a bucket of candy to pass out because it's in my stomach. So uh, anyway, don't come to my house Thursday. I won't have anything for you guys, but uh, I love you anyway. So, <laughs> All right, superheroes. Do you have some favorites? Do you don't have a favorite superhero? You got a, you got a superhero? Who's yours? The Green Lantern, really? You know, that's a guy you don't hear much of. I like him, though. Very cool. Anybody else? I know girls, we're allowed to have superhero faves, too. Anybody? Anybody? Batman and Robin. Uh, so, s side note, I'm sorry. Uh, this is free. But when Mr. Brett called us up for pastor's appreciation and I said, I'm Batman, uh, Dave leaned over and said, well, who does that make me? No. <laughs> I, I don't know. We'll just leave it at that. But <laughs> Pastor Dave, interpret that however you want. So, yes, Batman and Robin, very good. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Superhero, just superheroes in general. I love it. I love it. Man, these Avenger movies have really brought out the superhero stuff, haven't they? Like, man, I don't even know. Thanos, is that his name? The bad guy, the villain? Yeah. Um, Yes, Captain Marvel, you have Captain America. I mean, you just have all these superheroes. Do you know, well, before I get there, I want to ask you guys another question. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh, invisibility. What is it? You would want to be cotton candy? Would you just constantly, like, eat yourself and lick yourself because you would taste so good? I think I would. That would be a temptation for me. What would you? Laser eyes. That's awesome. Do you know what your superpower, like what would you want to do? I would want to fly. <gasps> she said give out flowers. <laughs> that is the best thing I've ever heard. That is a wonderful superpower. I love your heart. Do you have a superpower if you could do anything? Ooh, climb walls, kind of like Spider-Man. Yeah, awesome. I would definitely want to fly. Like, I just have this really, I don't know, cool imagination of just, like, taking off and kind of looking over everything. And I'd, I'd fly over oceans, mountains. I just, I, I would love that view, I think. I just would love to fly. Can you take a guess at who my favorite superhero is? I am Batman. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just don't do it justice. That was terrible. Anyway, yes, Batman, I think I, I had to think a little bit about this because growing up, I thought back to some of the superheroes that I looked up to and some of the movies. The movies help us kind of create that image in our heads of our favorite superheroes. And I just remember watching Batman, and I loved the Batmobile. I loved Batman's gadgets, right? Like his, I, I mean, just there's just so many things that were so cool. And I loved the fact that, he, like, he just he just wanted to help people. You know what I mean? Like, he, he was just this ordinary dude, Bruce Wayne, um, and, and he really didn't have a superpower. Um, it's not like he could be invisible or have laser eyes or anything. He was just kind of a, a common ordinary, normal guy, and 
there was something bad that happened in his life, and he decided to use that something bad for good, to help other people. And I just always thought, even in my adult life now, I think I just really appreciate and I love Batman, right? Do you know, uh, do you know who else is, like, super uh, just kind of common and, uh, what? <laughs> Robin is super common, you're right, yes. Uh, who would be, like, normal, everyday people? Take a look at each other. You. Yeah, we're just kind of everyday, normal, common, awesome people, right? That God uses every day to share his superpowers. Now, what do you think, what do you think God's superpower is? God's su- <laughs> to help people, that's right. His superpower is to help people, to love people, to save people. Uh, I got to thinking about this, and if if I could kind of sum up, all right, the superpower of God, because he is like the ultimate superhero. We just sang about it. He's better than Spider-Man, better than Superman, even better than Batman, right? He is ultimate superhero. Like, there's no contest with him. There's no villain. There's no evil dude out there that can even come close to taking down God, Right? Do you guys know that? So I got to thinking, how, how, well, how would I, like, sum up God's superpower? Because he's so big and he's so powerful. I, I couldn't even, like, we'd be here for the next week if I tried to list all the superpowers of God. So I got to thinking, and, and, and Pastor Dave's going to touch on this here in a little bit. I am. That word kept coming, or that phrase kept coming to my mind, I am. Can you guys say that, I am? I am. Now, that doesn't, that's not talking about you. That's talking about God. In the book of Exodus, uh, in the story of Moses, you guys have heard of Moses. We've talked about him a lot in Kidman. God meets Moses at the burning bush to tell him, hey, go save my people. And Moses makes up all the excuses like, well, man, I don't speak very well. That's okay. Uh, Well, who should I say sent me? And God says, you tell Pharaoh, I am sent to you. And I think that phrase, I am, I am, I am, sums it all up. Because that means he is everything. He is creator. Did you know he created everything, the universe, the stars, us? No other superhero can do that. He sustains everything. He keeps everything in motion. No other superhero can do that. He saves us from our sins. No other superhero can do that. He raised from the dead. No other superhero can do that. There's so many things. He's so super awesome and super powerful. And you know what? When you guys invite him to live in your heart forever, you get to experience that superpower Because he's going to use you, our common people, we're just regular folks, right? He's going to use you in your schools, in your families, within your friends, eventually someday where you work. He's going to use you. You just have to remember you have that power within you because you have an amazingly big, awesome God living within you. There's a uh, man in the Bible that Pastor Dave's going to talk about today who was very common. And God used him in mighty, mighty, mighty ways. So I'm going to wrap it up. I've got some donuts. I've got some some papers to hand out to you in just a moment. Uh, Before we pray, do you want to take a guess at who Pastor Dave's uh, superhero would be? Or if he could dress up as anybody, do you know who it would be? Robin again? Yeah, Pastor Dave, I'm sorry, man. You're, You're really falling on this Robin sword. All right. Anybody, any other guesses? What do you think? If Pastor Dave could be anybody, like his superhero. The Hulk? (laughs) I don't know why I'm laughing so hard. That's awesome. (laughs) Oh, I love you guys. All right. We're going to pray. And uh, you know what? Uh, I would like 
to pray, this, this is kind of a side note, but Nolan Asman, who we prayed for last week, who had surgery, he's just experiencing a lot of pain right now and uh, from his surgery. So I want to make sure we lift him up in prayer today and that God would use his superpowers of healing to touch Nolan today, okay? All right, hands together, eyes closed, heads bowed. Jesus, thank you so much for being the ultimate superhero. Thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you for using everyday people like us to share your word, your love, your holiness with others. Jesus, I ask that you would be with Nolan right now where he is. I pray that as he lays in the hospital bed and, and he's just experiencing some pain and discomfort, that you would send your healing upon him that you would comfort him, that you would uh, be with him in such a way that he would know it's you. And Lord, be with uh, Tori and Christian and Lila as they are there loving him and comforting him and being there to just support him through this. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you again for your superpowers that live within us. In Jesus' name, amen. So what's up, guys? Oh boy. So I heard the Incredible Hulk. I also heard Robin. I'm not thrilled about that one. Any guesses? No? Adults? We've been spending time in Leviticus. Moses! I, uh, Moses is my superhero, and we'll explain that here in just a little bit. You guys can have a seat, and I promise I won't hit you with my staff on your way out. Think of the iPad as uh, God's modern day of uh, tablets or stones, all right? Uh, it's the best we can do. And Moses obviously wore a smart device on his wrist. Uh, I just forgot to take that off and noticed it on my way here. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're going to talk about Moses today. We've been in the book of Leviticus. For those of you that are visiting, and we've been talking about how God desires for us to be his holy people and what we can learn from that. The two critical people in Leviticus are God himself and Moses. Now, Moses was one of my favorite biblical characters growing up, and, and maybe for you it was that. It was like, I loved David and Goliath, too. There's something great about that story. Uh, and we have these kind of heroes of the faith, don't we? And maybe some of you didn't grow up in church, and you're like, who's Moses? Well, that's okay, too. We're going to share with you a little bit about uh, Moses today. So I remember growing up, and I, I didn't have a, I should have said, I had enough time. I just didn't think of it soon enough to order a really cool white beard from Amazon. Uh, so just, it, it would have happened. I just don't think that far ahead. Uh, Moses, to me, had this really cool beard, like Duck Dynasty styles, only white. Um, he would have worn perhaps a robe maybe like this, though he might not have got it from uh, Brett and Amy's closet. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Perhaps he would have had on some kicking Air Moses sandals. I don't know if they had those back in the day. Uh, I could not find a pair, so barefoot this morning. Uh, we think of Moses, oftentimes we think of him coming down to deliver these two tablets of stone that the Lord etched into his commandments on how we can love him and how we can love others. Uh, perhaps we find one of the great symbols of him is his staff which thanks to Ed Rogers and his woods this morning, I now have a really cool staff. Now, if I throw this down this morning and it turns into a snake, just run. <laughs> right, please. If you don't see me back here, it's because I'm terrified of snakes, and uh, that would just be creepy to me. But, but God used the staff of Moses to demonstrate not the power of the staff, not the power of Moses, but rather the power and authority of God. And we're going to see that over and over in Scripture. And so we find that Moses, this man, that he would meet God, and the very first time was in the form of this burning bush, right? Because one couldn't see the full glory of God and behold it and not be killed, okay? Because of God's magnitude, so big, he's so amazing that one could not gaze into the eyes of God and live. So God came in the form of a burning bush that was not consumed. And that's how he first began to communicate to Moses, 
And so we find here that God would use Moses, and he'd take a staff, and we talked about it, he'd turn it into to a snake, and, and God would use Moses to uh, kind of bring these plagues upon the Egyptian. You remember those, like real creepy, kind of bizarre plagues, uh, things like turning uh, the Nile River into blood, things like making this plague of frogs just as you sleep, think uh, little frogs are sleeping next to me here, really gross, uh, think uh, about gnats. Anybody have those this year in excess? Yeah, I think we went through like four or six of the little apple uh, traps from Ace, right? Because they became immune to Dawn dish soap and that whole ingredient thing. But man, a plague of gnats. Uh, there would be animals that would be killed. Uh, there would be a breakout of boils. Huh? Uh, there would be a hailstorm of fire. How cool would that be to see, just not be in? Uh, and so we'd find God doing these things. He'd bring death to the firstborn, both of people and of animals. We would see that Moses would stretch out his staff, maybe one of the most popular images, and he'd strike the ground, and the Red Sea would split or part and the people of God would walk through that we would find that there would be a cloud or a pillar of fire that would be formed uh, we'd find that this stick God would use with Moses to remove toxins from water uh, another really great moment of of Moses is this cool kind of hero like figure is the Israelites were thirsty and, and they were complaining because oh man we were just let out of slavery but woe is us right uh, we need some water Moses and so God instructs Moses, Moses, I want you to strike this rock with your staff and what will come forth? Thank God there was no water that just popped up there. But, but water sprang forth so that the people of, of Israel or what would soon to be Israel could uh, have nourishment. You'd find that this staff and, and Moses would be instrumental in defeating army, armies that would oppose them. You see, throughout Scripture, we have lots of reasons to believe that Moses perhaps was one of the first superheroes of humanity, right? I mean, he did things that were not human, thus being superhuman, right? Things that, that nobody else could do, nobody else could take credit for. In fact, in, in one of these, in Exodus chapter 17, uh, we're going to find Moses on this mountain. A and Joshua was in battle against this group of people called the Amalekites, right? And what they found was that as Moses was up on this mountain, as he kept his stick held high, that Joshua and the army would continue to be victorious. But what happened is Moses' arms got tired and and this staff started to drop. What started to change? Yeah, the, the Amalekites would begin to have the upper hand. And, and so Moses would raise it up again. And, and they would begin to win in battle. And over and over this would happen. And so he had some friends that went and got a rock and thought, well, we'll just get a rock so Moses can lean up against and sit on this rock and it'll keep that staff high. So he was seated, seating and uh, kept his staff up and God's people were victorious, but then his arms continued to get weary. And so then we find Aaron, who is one of the priests we read about in Leviticus, and this other gentleman named Hur would come, and they would help Moses keep his staff held high. Isn't that great? Because they knew that the Lord was giving them victory in this. The story of Moses is exceptional. Here we have this staff-wielding, miracle-working, army-defeating, getting people out of slavery man. And if we just stop there, we can think, man, Moses was, what a superhero. But we really need to go back in the story a bit to find out who the real superhero was in this. Because we can learn a lot about Moses from his past. So if we go all the way back uh, into Exodus, and in chapter 2 there, if you'd like to just take a look for reference, uh, we're going to find that, that Moses was essentially at birth sentenced to death row. All right, He was sentenced to die. So Pharaoh became threatened by the growth of the Hebrew people, and so he had his midwives that would help give birth. If the child was born a female, they could live, but if that child was born a male, he instructed his midwives to not let the child survive. 
So Moses' mother was aware of this, and so she had him apart from this and then hid him until she couldn't hide him any longer. And then the the story tells us in Scripture that she would put him in a basket and send him to the Nile River to protect him from being killed. Now, interestingly enough, Moses was then found by the Pharaoh's daughter. And in one moment, perhaps they gasped, thinking, oh no, he's been found and he's going to be killed. But in that moment, God does something, I believe, in the life of this daughter. And that is that she had compassion. And she took this child in as her own. And then through a whole series of really cool events, God doesn't just stop there, but he actually finds a way for Moses' mother to come into the picture to nurse him and help raise him until the scripture says, till he was weaned. Wow, that's bizarre. Should have been killed. He was sentenced to death row, and yet now he's living in the palace. How crazy is that? He, deserved, he, he really deserved to die according to Pharaoh's standards, and yet something happened, or rather someone happened that intervened. We find then that Moses would be a prince in the palace. That would last for about 40 years, and then Moses would go from prince to shepherd. Anybody ever do that? Like, I don't know about you, but uh, I would not want to give up the palace to take care of sheep. Now, I also received this from Miss Barr. There's someone around here that I believe does a great sheep impersonation. And so Shepherd, or, or, or so Moses, would leave the palace and then he would travel over 300 miles to become, guess what? Not a prince, but a herder of. Yeah. Bring it on, man. <laughs> Bring it on. There we go. There we go. How, yeah. For the love, somebody make him stock before my staff does. Thanks for being a good sport, Berkey. So he fled 300 miles to this place called Midian, right, to become a sheep herder. Now, he did this because he witnessed some Egyptians abusing some of his own people. And so in the midst of that, Moses took it into his own hands, ended up killing an Egyptian, and then he tried to hide it. Because who wants to really leave the palace, right? Like, oh, you know what? I really got it really good here, so we'll just pretend that didn't happen. But then word got out. And Moses knew that if they found out he had killed an Egyptian, that his life would be threatened, so he fled. Then Moses comes to this land, and guess what he sees? He sees two shepherd men oppressing some women. Now, we know already that Moses doesn't handle people oppressing others well, right? So what does he do? He steps in and intervenes and saves the two gals. Interestingly enough, Moses would marry one of those gals. Her name's Zipporah, and he would end up in the household of a man named Jethro. So track with me here. So so Moses was a prince for approximately 40 years, and now he's fleeing 300 miles away to become a shepherd. You want to guess for how long? 40 years. He's going to be in the desert as a shepherd. And now in this moment, as he's shepherding sheep, there's this all-consuming fire, right? That's burning in this bush, yet the bush is not being consumed. You see, it was in this moment, in the pastures, in the wilderness, that Moses encounters God. And maybe at this time he was finally ready to depend on something other than his own intelligence and strength. So to this point, Moses probably felt pretty good about himself, right? Like, hey, I I escaped the hand of one of the most powerful men in the known world. I ran to the shepherding place. I rescued some young gals, some damsels in distress, right? Uh, And then one of them became my wife. Like my intellect, my uh, efforts have done pretty well so far. And in this moment, something is going to happen. He was going to have an encounter 
with someone that was far greater than he could ever imagine. And as he has this encounter with God, and God lays out his plan for Moses, now we find out who Moses really is. And are you ready for this? Here's what the word of God is going to tell us is, is really at the depths of who he is. He was someone that really didn't believe in himself or that God would help him. Someone that lacked a sense of confidence. In fact, he would say, who am I? Who am I? Like, Lord, I'm, a, I'm an escaped convict that's herding sheep. Who am I? Why didn't you use me as the prince? Could have done something there, right? Didn't believe in himself. Neither did he believe in the God who was commissioning him or sending him. For who has sent me? Who do I tell them that I am? What if they don't believe me? Oh, Moses wouldn't stop there. He would continue to say, Lord, who am I? You know I don't speak well. You know who you're talking to, right? You know who I am, and this isn't going to go well. And finally, he concludes with this. Send someone else. Anybody ever said that before? Don't shake your head no at me. You're all a bunch of liars this morning. Maybe I'm the only one. Lord, send someone else. Been there before. In fact, there may be chances I'm there again. Because God often asks things that I look at and go, you want me or us to do what? Use another church. Right? Send someone else. Send someone who can. And we all have that in our minds, right? Now, I don't want to go talk to people. Let's let Dooley go do that. I'm not real good at, at preaching or speaking. But I know a guy. Let's see if we can make it happen, right? Well, man, you know what? I really don't have much of a voice, and I don't think I can sing. But I know a guy. Send someone else. And I don't work well with kids. But I know someone. Send someone else. Uh, you know what? Elderly people just creep me out. Don't look at me like I'm the, trust me. I know some of y'all. It's why we don't go to nursing homes. And I've said it. Lord, send someone else. And over and over again, the Lord is calling to his people then and today. I'm sending you, you go, not an option, not in our strength, but rather with him. I've said that before. I've, I, I've questioned the Lord to say, Lord, who am I? When, when I felt called to be a pastor is the first time of going, Lord, who am I? I guess I'm good with teenagers. Leave me here. Who am I? We've all made excuses. Moses made excuses, and yet God had an answer for every single excuse Moses could make. I believe God does the same for us today. The first is simply this, and I believe it echoes what we've been learning in Leviticus. You see, God didn't start something in Exodus. He changed halfway through in the book of Leviticus. Rather, God's character was the same yesterday, today, and forever and so we're going to see this dominant theme taking shape here and the first is this that God says I will be with you Moses we learned last week who does God choose you me God chooses us and he says I will be with you so he says to Moses, you're right, Moses. <laughs> you're not that special. But I am. We're going to come back to that in a moment. 
You see, here's what I believe God needed to work with, and that was a man that was willing to be humble, not arrogant. Someone that was willing to say, who am I, what do I have to offer, so that as he fulfilled the work of God, God could say, I am the one. We see this in Pharaoh because we know that Pharaoh was aggressively arrogant, hardened his heart to anything that the Lord wanted to do. Here's what I know today. My special, your special, apart from God, (laughs) is nothing compared to God. The I am. So it is God that chose you. He is the only presence that matters as we live this life. In fact, Jesus would say it this way in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, 16. Right? It says this. You did not choose me, but rather I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Caleb talked about the fruits of the Spirit this morning. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This isn't the cosmic genie like, Lord, I'd really like a Corvette tomorrow. It's not going to happen, right? And if it did, that's really obscure. It's not about our possessions or our things, but rather, am I willing to say, Lord, whatever you choose to give me, I'll use for your glory. Whatever, anything, however that may be. Some people he gives immense wealth to. I don't know why, just happens. Their responsibility is to say, Lord, with everything that you've given to me, I will give you. And some of you on this room have nothing, absolutely nothing, and yet the Lord is saying, with everything that I have given you, because it's something, Our response is, Lord, I give you everything. All that I have. doesn't matter. So whether poor or rich, it's about giving to the Lord because we recognize he is the one that is given to us in any and all seasons of life. And then we go on last week. We learned that we are a chosen royal priesthood through Christ. So God was speaking to Moses back in Exodus I will be with you, Moses. I choose you. Secondly is this. God says, Moses, I will give you. I will give you. So so perhaps in this moment he's saying, you're right, Moses. You don't have the right words. You don't have the right things to convey maybe in a way that you've seen conveyed before. You don't have command over all things, but I am. You see, God has always given the tools necessary to accomplish his purpose, right? All all through scripture, God's chosen instruments in humanity, he has given them all the tools they need to carry out his purpose purpose. Last week in Leviticus, we learned about this ram of ordination, and ordination means filling, and that filling literally meant equipping us with all the tools and the name that's important to carry those out. It was a commissioning, and so in the midst of this, God over the span of 40 years would be equipping Moses in the wilderness to then lead his people out of Pharaoh's palace, guess where? Into the the wilderness. That's not coincidental, folks. Moses learned how to survive in the wilderness by being in the wilderness. Praise God. Only God could equip Moses that way. So God fills and equips and he says, Moses, take this staff. He says, Moses, I will teach you what you are to say. We find in the New Testament that Christ issues a decree to believers to say, I am the one that will gift you to carry out my plan. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, many of us know this, verses 11 through 13, it says, so Christ gave the himself, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith in the knowledge of the Son of God who becomes mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. 
church this morning over and over. God's saying, I choose you. I am the one that will equip you and fill you. Just stop making excuses and be obedient. And in that obedience, then again, he tells Moses, Moses, I'm sending you. Perhaps he said, you're right, Moses. You show back up to the palace on your own merits, you're probably going to die. You just, you killed some of their people. You think they're just going to forget about that, even though it's a new Pharaoh in town? You show up back there on your own, you may die. But then he says, you tell them who's sending you. And who does he tell them is sending him? The I am. Why is that important to us today? It's important to us today because when God says, I am who I am, God is essentially stating there is no authority above me. I am who I am. So this Pharaoh may think he has authority, but you tell him the I am who I am has sent you, and it will cause him to think, wait a minute, that means there's one that has greater authority than me. See, in this, perhaps it's about a submission to authority. Listen, folks, this morning, sometimes we can believe in our life like a Pharaoh and other people would that we are our own authority. We're the ones that determines what's right. We're the ones that are in control of our own destiny kind of garbage, right? And God's saying, hey, (laughs) you think you're your own authority? And over and over in the Old Testament, he's going to tell his people, you make really lousy gods really bad guys i can tell you i make a very lousy god just ask my wife but there is one that is the i am who i am that says i speak authority over all authorities for who can stand against the i am so in the midst of all of this in christ we are then called to be part of this redemptive story the story of Moses should teach us that Moses wasn't in fact on his own merits any kind of superhero person but rather Moses served a God that was the I am the authority above all authorities the name above all names they called him Yahweh and that word was used more in the Old Testament than we could imagine I am. Church, this morning, it is God's presence alone that tells us we are his instruments chosen by him, that fills us with all the tools necessary to carry out his work. And it says when we go, you go not by your authority or might, but you go by the might of of the Holy Spirit that lives within your heart. You tell the world, the I am has sent you to proclaim freedom to the captives. You tell them as you go to the sick and hurting that there is one that can heal their heart, one that can give them hope beyond this life. You tell them as you go about how great our God is. Church, today, I don't know where you go, and I've been preaching this for 11 years. Someday, I think it's already starting to click. Someday, it's going to really fire. When you go, wherever it is you go, that's the Great Commission. As I go, this isn't some missionary experience like we got to leave the United States of America to fulfill the will of God. Jesus is saying, wherever it is you go, I don't care if that's school. I don't care if that's into a factory. It doesn't matter where, but rather that the I am is with you and you are called to go make disciples. Stop depending on your pastors to do this. That's my responsibility. I will continue to go, but I can't do it for you. We are a weak church if you diminish this to three staff people in Hardin County or the 50 pastors that we might have. 
You know what my heart is? That you who are chosen and filled with every gift necessary will be sent. And perhaps you go into your workplaces in the weeks ahead and you say, you know what, I just want to have prayer with a group of people. We don't need to come to church for that. We don't need to call Pastor Dave. You don't need to go into work and go, man, I feel like we need to have prayer. Let me call Pastor Dave. Why don't you come over here and do this? You know what my response is going to be? I'd love to join you, but why don't you lead that? Because his authority is far greater than mine. Church, today it's time to stop waiting. What if Moses would have waited longer? What if he just would have said, Lord, nope, I'm out. Send somebody else. I believe the Lord would have found a way to carry out redemption ultimately through Christ. But listen, he chooses us. He fills us. He sends us. Kids, where are you all at in the house? Wake up for a moment. Kids, you hear? Look at Pastor Dave. Just look at me for a minute. Y'all, I know some of you adults still kids. That's cool. Kids, God is using you too. We need children in our schools and in our hallways that are willing to minister the love of Jesus to your classmates. I believe you guys can make a major difference when we're willing to say, Lord, here I am. Send me. And adults, wouldn't it be great if we just patterned that for them? <laughs> wouldn't it be great? It'd be great if you walked into your factory on lunch break and you just said, hey man, why don't we just get together and pray this week? We got needs all over this factory. It's a place of darkness. There's people that need the love of Jesus. We ought to, we ought to pray about this and see how the Lord might use us. What if it's in your classroom? I know that's not popular in today's culture. Listen, I don't believe they can silence you when you decide to say, you know what, in my room, I'm just going to decide to pray. And if maybe before school or after school or on our lunch break, there's some other teachers that'd like to join me, guess what? Why don't you bring them along and say, let's just be obedient to the Lord today. Great news is, you don't need a staff to do it, right? That's weird. Please don't take a staff into your, you may get kicked out. But you have the I am who I am that is with you. And so as we stand today, I don't know how the Lord's speaking to you, but I know how he wants to. Can I say that? Because I believe the Lord wants to use you right where you're at. Some of you students today, you need to say, Lord, you know what? Just help me. I've never done this before. But I know you're with me. So whatever you want me to do, Jesus, help me. Some of you teenagers here, you have an opportunity to make a difference in your schools as well. And one that isn't just about good morality, but one that can change people's lives. I don't know where you're sending me, Jesus, but, but here I am, just send me. Some of you teachers in this place, I know it's hard. Watch my wife go through it from a substitute position, and it's not easy days, right? <laughs> but I believe God has chosen you, and he has equipped you to educate. And it's more than just about filling kids with knowledge. Perhaps it's about taking the presence of Jesus into those buildings and classrooms. Nobody can stop that. Don't be rude about it. Don't be a jerk, right? Just be willing and obedient. Y'all that work in the labor force or in public areas of service, thank you for what you do for us. But I believe the Lord wants to do more than just use you to create parts for Honda. I believe the Lord wants to do more within you than just to punch a time card. I believe the Lord has equipped you and sent you. Will you be obedient? Because the I am, who I am, is with you just as he was with the one that would speak to a sea part and it parts this morning as we pray might we just be obedient to the Lord today in our response and as we walk out of this place say Lord I don't know what it looks like just help me to be obedient we love you Lord let's pray Heavenly Father I thank you 
Thank you for this superhero Sunday, Lord, where we get to have a little fun and, and Lord, we get to reflect on Jesus and what he has done for us and he is, by every sense of the term, our superhero today, that which has rescued us from the pit of despair and our sinfulness. And Lord, yet we also know then that you are calling us, your word says, to be ambassadors, that we would go and represent the I am. We submit to your authority. We accept your relationship in choosing with us through Christ. We ask that you fill us, Lord, and eliminate all of our excuses. And Lord, we ask today that you send us. If that's a desert-looking place, send us, Lord. Whatever it looks like, send me. We love you, Jesus. We praise your name. Thank you for your work from the beginning of human history through all of eternity. Fill us, encourage us, send us. In the strong name of our Father, all God's children said, for God is good and all the time. I love you guys. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.